so what's the fix? Well, originally, I didn't realize the extent of what happened. So I was thinking perhaps I was just going to put a rain screen right over the T-111 and treat it, you know, put a like WRV yeah. Yeah, as a sheathing. But then, um, you know, I, I leaned on the window and it fell out of the house. <laughs> and, um, Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Rob Wadsack, Digital Brand Manager. Hello. Video Producer Colin Russell. Hey there. And Producer Jeff Rose. Hi there. Thanks for joining me, guys. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me. Nice you know, to be the, back. It's the, been listener, a while. the listeners were clamoring for you to be on the show, Colin. Uh huh. I'm sure that was my wife and daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. Nobody clamoring for me, though, right? Oh, they always clamor for you, Rob. Oh, thanks. Yeah. They just expect you to be here. It's been a while. You guys, you guys have been on a long run with you, Matt and Kylie, haven't you? They've been around. Kylie's been willing to do the show, which is not a given. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've been rolling with that team. Cool. But I like a diversity of voices, and I think the listeners do too. So those of you who are out there uh, and want to make a suggestion who be, should be on the show, uh, don't say take me off because I won't do it. But uh, <laughs> anyone else, I'd love to hear. So we had some feedback regarding uh, episode 230 where we had a conversation about housing affordability based originally on a conversation that we had at the Builder Show with Steve Basic. And uh, someone wrote in and said, does that mean that like only wealthy people should be able to afford architectural services? And uh, we heard a number of uh, folks who replied to that. And part of it was affordability, right? And we heard from Andy Engel, uh, regarding the housing costs in episode 230, there are many, many factors, of course, but land development looms very large. Look around any build-up town, and you'll probably see that the easy building lots got used up years ago. What's left isn't flat, well-drained cornfields. It's steep, rocky parcels that, at least in Connecticut, have sensitive wetlands that require protection. Certainly not, not the case everywhere, but around here it is. Anytime you need a hydraulic camera on an excavator or dynamite to put in a road or foundation hole, your costs skyrocket. Uh, similarly, someone, uh, this was Bruce from Lincoln, Rhode Island, uh, interesting show this week, number 230 on the affordable house issue. It's all about land. They're not making any more of it. Regulation usually means zoning and it's the lever existing residents pull to keep development expensive. I'm a long time TV slash print media member and every zoning commission meeting has a few regulars to whom the answer to any question about development is no. On the flip side, developers want to pack as many high-end homes onto land they've acquired regardless of how the project will affect the area. It would be nice if planners and developers would cooperate to develop affordable housing in appropriate spaces near public transportation. You and I were talking about this at lunch today. Yes, we were. So in your neighborhood, which I think would be fair to say started out as a pretty affordable community, there's been this transition to increasingly expensive and bigger homes, right? Um. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, I mean, there was a big factor was we're on the coast of the Long Island Sound. So all the coastal homes after the um, hurricanes Sandy, yeah. Yeah, um, have gone up on piers, et cetera. But um, there's actually a lot of affordable housing developments going up in my town, which, you know, it, it's very crowded now. Yeah. You know, it's a Can super you, crowded Do you town. notice a difference? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've lived there going on 20 years now, so... In the 20 years I've lived there, it went from a sort of sleepy little town to, like, a lot of traffic. What changed? It just seems like a lot of a lot a lot of people, condos, affordable housing. Um, Where are they working? I haven't asked them. <laughs> <laughs> How far I, uh, is it to the city for you, from to New York? It's an hour and a half on Metro North. Um, I suspect a lot of the people are working semi-locally. I think Stanford's probably a big hub. Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. As opposed to New Haven. But, I, I, you know, just all the traffic, the whole traffic corridor is going in that direction. So um, Towards Yale. Well, Yale is actually north. Uh-huh. Um, south is Stanford. And that's, I think that's, there's a lot going on in Stanford. Interesting. Have you noticed a change in your community? So... You know, it's funny. I, I live about the same distance away from the busy places as Colin does, but it, but he has the thing about being along a major um, interstate corridor and also being near the coast where 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 we are up in northern Connecticut. It's um, it still feels like not a lot has changed, at least since the housing bubble burst, you know, a bunch of years ago. Um, 
our town is still one of the more affordable places that is a little bit more of a stretch for people to commute to. So like my property values haven't gone up that much in the time that I've When you I've see new there. development around uh, New Milford, and I find it interesting, you live in Milford and you live in New Milford. Yep. Uh, w- what kind of development is it? You know, there's not a whole lot of big developing developments going up in my area. If you go a little bit closer to the suburbs and the city from where I am, there's a lot of um, like multi-story affordable housing type of complexes going and attractive looking buildings. I don't know what, uh, you know, what they're calling affordable for our area, but, uh, probably isn't, but, um, uh, there's, and I've heard from a lot of people that there, there's definitely a, uh, not enough rental properties because the, a lot of pe- younger people aren't in, prepared to buy in our area. Cause as you know, you know, living in this part of the country, house houses are not easy to get into price wise. Yeah. And you know, conventional mor- mortgage requires a 20% down payment. You can lower that significantly with mortgage insurance, but I think that's a huge obstacle to many folk is to save, you know, what amounts to thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to, to buy something. It's difficult. And, and to be stuck in one place where. Yeah. Cause people change around for jobs. And, yeah. uh, Bruce also, we so in the same episode, we had a discussion of our favorite uh, YouTube and other channels for home improvement content. And uh, Bruce, in addition to his thoughts on development, uh, sent in some suggestions, and we'll put those on the podcast page. Uh, he mentioned uh, Finnish Carpentry TV, which is on YouTube. Goes Forth Handyman, also on YouTube. Uh, Pete Millard's 10-Minute Workshop. And uh, for me, he spe- specified the the farm project, which I think you would love this too. So this guy seems to take decrepit lawnmowers and tries to run them on any uh, substance that he can. WD-40, kerosene, uh, ether. Um, so he's like modifying the carburetors and stuff? Yeah, or? and then he has the fuel drain. It's pretty <clears throat> incredible. And he's on a couple of occasions like replaced the existing solar head with, in one instance, clear plastic, which was kind of fun to watch. Uh, he made another hill- cylinder head out of JB Weld uh, and, and machined it r- crudely and screwed a spark plug into it and made this lawnmower run. So Amazing. It, it's fun. <laughs> I don't see the purpose of any of this, but it sure is fun. And I think uh, Bruce nailed me for my interest. Uh, we also heard from someone who made reference to Justin, Adam, uh, he said, I was driving uh, in this morning catching up on some FHB podcast and couldn't believe what I heard in episode. Tw- uh, ju- in the episode, Justin said he loves the big box stores. You should have him tested for coronavirus. <laughs> the big box stores are the worst. Here are just a few reasons why. They se- The products they sell are often of c- questionable quality. For example, it's a fact that the toilets they sell are about those that came off the production line with minor imperfections. I don't know that this is true. Uh, for sure, but this is what... Um, the tools or the toilets? He said well, toilets. he said toilets, and, and he mentions tools a little bit later on. B- basically, the point he's trying to make... Is this stuff is, is inferior. Is that, you know, ever since Walmart started driving... It, I think that Walmart was one of the first companies that was causing manufacturers to go based on what the retailers wanted. They not, would say, we yeah. want to sell a <clears throat> two-gallon jar of Velasic pickles, Velasic, and we'll sell a gazillion of them will you do it? And in that case, they did it and almost put Vlasic out of business. Yeah, and, and there's and there's some claims, and I'm sure it's true for some and maybe not for others, that a lot of products that are designed to be sold specifically in the big box stores are possibly slightly different from the models that are... Value uh, engineered. Yeah, that are, uh, you know, that you might buy from a different retailer. So Justin wrote back to Adam and said, you know, do you really know this to be true? And Adam said, no, he really didn't, but this was... The indication, it yeah. is sort of, I've heard that a lot in the field. Uh, he also says, tool manufacturers design their products based on what big box stores tell them they need, which is true. Yes. Uh, they will uh, develop a specific model to sell in those channels, and they usually have uh, lesser batteries and other things to make them less expensive, and you especially see them around the holidays during gift-giving time. But uh, those of you out there who have specific examples of where a big box store is somehow different than something you get at a supply house or an independent retailer, I would love to have those because we've been hearing these rumors for many years and uh, it hasn't really panned out. Maybe we're going to have to get a couple and cut them open and take a look. So there's been some some talk of that. Um, but you just have to make sure you're comparing the exact 
uh, model number, the UPC code, because sometimes they do have different products made for the that channel versus the supply house. So, yeah, because I've even seen televisions where they have like a W added to the to the uh, product number because they were specifically meant to go to Walmart. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I believe you're going to find yeah. that's something I think is going to happen no matter what. You're going to find a number different because they have yeah. to differentiate like where are they being sold, for right. example. But if they are saying, no, it's of the same quality, let's cut it open and find out. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. If there's two plastic gears, are we going to know which one is denser plastic? I right. But really, you know, the, the the main point when you're comparing the big box stores to your local, especially your local high end building supply places, is just, I mean, you're talking about different level of product availability and different level of service typically. Um, but, it, you know, it depends on what your goal is. It's like if, like me personally working on my own house, I'm probably going to go to the box store just because of timing and convenience. Yeah, they're open on the weekend. But if I were, but if I were working on a remodeling project, I would be going to the building supply store because they would deliver for free to my job site. I don't have to go wander around a, a building and pick things out. I know that the, some of the box stores are actually offering those types of services now, but it's just, um, you know, it really depends on what your priorities on are on the project you're working on. I was talking to uh, plumber Tom Cardillo on a recent photo shoot, and he was talking about where he shops for plumbing stuff. And not surprisingly, he has a couple of local supply houses that he uses. And uh, one of the primary reasons he mentioned is because when he has a problem, they take care of it. You know, they contact the manufacturer, they get the replacement product working. It's like it's 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 handled for him. And and boy, that's worth a lot if you're a pro, especially. Yeah, if you're a pro, I get it. But like, what about us serial DIY remodelers? Right. What do we do? I mean, we yeah. don't. We can't really build that kind of relationship they don't want to see us in some cases right it, we're a hassle at the, at the supply house potentially I, fe- I feel that way sometimes whether they really feel that way about me they probably do um no, d- you I, know i've gotten that because yeah. you're not spending <clears throat> you know t- thousands or tens of thousands of dollars a month you know i did that you get to know someone that way You've been busy with some uh, some carpentry, and uh, I, I must say it's kind of noble. <laughs> why is it noble? Because it's not for you. It's for a family member. Well, that's why I'm charging them. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not that noble. Um, yeah, no, I'm helping my sister out. Um, one side of her house had a lot of um, air leakage and water infiltration, and it was due to, oh, if you see the photograph, um, where there's clabbered now, that was T-111. And the T111 was right up against the studs. Yep. So you can imagine. So this was that. leaking around window openings and around the door, I presume, like they always do. Yes. And where it met across the top, there was sort of a freeze board, but it was allowing water to go directly in behind. Uh, what did that look like back there? Um, it was pretty scary. There was some, I think I found a new form of mycelium. <laughs> I sent it to Paul Stamets. We'll see if he, uh, if he comes back with any <laughs> test results. As Patrick coughs off, <laughs> off the mic. <laughs> I think it made me choke. Um, so, yeah. So, so what's the fix? Well, originally, I didn't realize the extent of what happened. So I was thinking perhaps I was just going to put a rain screen right over the T-111 and treat it, you know, put a like WRB a sheathing. Yeah. Yeah, as a sheathing. But then, um, you know, I, I leaned on the window and it fell out of the house. <laughs> and um, and uh, I grabbed the door and I had to cut maybe two or three finish nails for that to pop out really and yeah and it was pretty bad in there so i just stripped it down to the studs um put zip up taped it you know air sealed made it tight and so did you pull the t1 off completely yeah Yeah. exposed all the studs and um you can see here in the photo that there's still clabbard on the top that's unconditioned attic space Mm. and um you know those are fine and there was no water going in there and because i was putting uh this sheathing up and a rain screen for the clabbered that was projecting enough that when I finish this job, I don't really have to do much to clabbered right over the old clabbered. Cool. Um, I forget what's the name of that blue stuff I'm using there. The uh, pe- the blue skin. Yeah, the blue skin. So I'm I'm going to even though I probably don't need to, I'm going to continue that all the way up. I'm going to build some bucks around bucks around that window up there and uh, just continue the clabbered up. It's a cute house. I love the uh, fascia detail. Yeah, well, that's the old beach cottages that were built, 
essentially 100, 120 years ago down along the coast there. And, you know, now we live in them, you know. Year round. Year round, so. So that would have been someone's, like, second home, you, you presume? It, I presume, yeah. Yeah, cool. Or, vac- yeah, vacation home for sure. Looks good. Well, thank you. That's the LP, you know. What uh, do you think about that stuff? So we've talked to uh, Matt about it and Justin about it. What's your What's your assessment? Well, I mean, smart side, I should say. Optimistically skeptical. I mean, great to work with. The stuff's straight. You know, I was putting this up by myself. Um, really liked working with it. I was priming all my cuts, etc. But I'm not sure that you really need to because it seems very impregnated uh-huh. with uh, lots of glue. Lots of glue. So, I guess you know, time will tell as to if water does hit one of the cuts, will it? Will it swell or will whatever? Will it swell or what have you? But I kind of think it won't, but that's, you know. But no, I loved working with it. Cool. It's great. You've been uh, helping out family members too, right, Jeff? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we were, uh, my, my father-in-law lives out in California. And so while we were at the builder show, he was having surgery on his Achilles tendon. So my wife went out there to help him out. Um and when I got, I went there from Vegas, and when I got there, uh, he was complaining about having, he's got this peninsula with cabinets above it, and that's like the main entrance to the house is behind that, so you walk in, and it's just this wall of cabinets, and there's... It's kind of oppressive. Yeah. It, it's like, too, it's right in your face. Yeah, so I uh, I took all those out. You took the uppers out. Took, took the uppers out, you know, built a little soffit, because I couldn't repair the the drywall because it's all that weird textured thing they do out in California. Oh, yeah. Um, and then we, we put a, a couple of cabinets down at the end so he'd still have a place for his dishes and stuff. And uh, those are some of those uh, canless LED lights. So you put that in what was the uh, ex- the soffit above the cabinets. You made this little bulkhead uh, because you didn't want to patch the, the textured ceiling, and then and you put these and lights also, in it to make it look... Like it belongs there. Yeah, and, and we needed the light, so. Cool. It, it looks, looks fantastic. Yeah, it looks awesome. Thank How you. long did that take you? Uh, well, let's see. Sort of emptying the cabinets and dismantling everything was one day, then a day of shopping to get the material. Big box store? Uh, a combination of, big, we got the cabinets at the big box store, the lights at the big box store, um, and then went to the local lumber yard for the, the lumber. Um, and then it's like three days to put it all together. It looks great. Thanks. Do you want to finish my sister's gable end? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want so to on uh, your next vacation. Uh, is he satisfied as, with this kitchen remodel, or are there further uh, 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 refinements or changes to be made? Well, that, that, that's part of the whole thing is like it's all s- supposedly temporary because he wants to remodel the whole house, including moving the door and but I don't think that's going to happen. How old is this gentleman? Uh, 78. But <laughs> he could work any of us into the ground, though. <laughs> I believe it. You had an interesting development. Yeah, my, my daughter came to me the other day. She's like, Dad, can you fix the light in the shower? So I went in there. I pop out. It's one of those <clears throat> shower lights that has the gasketed glass yep. you know, cover on it. And, so, and it's meant to take a normal <clears throat> uh, Edison-based bulb, right? Yep. But I had, uh, but I years and years ago I had put a CFL in there, and I go and I go to grab it to unscrew it, and it cracks in my hand, <laughs> and I'm like, I, I barely held onto this thing, and, I, and then I when I finally reached up and grabbed the base of the thing, I pulled it out, and it kind of looks like a toasted marshmallow. It's awful looking. <laughs> It's I've seen that. It's the the whole base. I would have thought it was made out of ceramic. Maybe it's some sort of plastic, but the whole That's base plastic. is just like bubbly and black and brown. It and looks like when you're making <clears throat> uh, hard candy, right? And yeah. uh, and it's you have the syrup, and it's this caramelized. Yeah. yeah. Did you taste so it? We, so, <laughs> yeah, so, no, I still have it though. You want, you want to bring try? Bring it, it in. Bring it in. Let's uh, find out what but, this is made of. So I was like, this just seems like. Wrong. So I went and I searched CFL ballast meltdown or whatever online, and I found some uh, thread on some electrician's forum where they were talking about, uh, oh, yeah, this is this is how they typically go out when I see it. It's what I call the blaze of glory ending. <laughs> and uh, so it's apparently pretty common, and some guys were saying it was exclusive to 
the CFLs and some people say the LADs are doing that too, but it just it doesn't seem like something that gives me a whole lot of confidence about this. It these. looks like it was on fire. Yeah, I mean, it was. It, it looked like it was pretty close to catching yeah. on fire, but uh, I. I find these things just do not last like they promised us they would. They were telling us that they would last a lifetime, right? And it's I funny. Guess that was true for some people. <laughs> 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 I, I hate them. I, yeah. I, I hate the noise they make. I hate the, the flickeriness. I, I don't like anything well, about it. Well, so, can, can you even find a CFL anymore? I mean, have LEDs completely replaced them now? I don't know. Oh, I believe they're still out. Because well, they're cheaper, mm. I, I'm, I would imagine, still. Now, you said this broke, like when you it, did the it glass. Br- the glass must have gotten brittle from the heat or so something like that. isn't there the stuff inside these? Not yeah, good? Mer- yeah. It's mercury vapor. Yeah, it's not good for you. Yeah, I, I completely cleaned the entire shower and bathroom after that. What <laughs> did you uh, replace it with? These right now. I replaced it with, I had a, an LED bulb about the same size, sitting around with a normal old-fashioned bulb base, and we'll see how that one, long that one lasts. But... Uh, but yeah, the bathroom can lights. I've had some other weird stuff. Like one of them. Do you think it's the humidity of the bathroom? I don't know, humidity or the fact that these are in enclosed. You know, they're they're meant to be enclosed. They have the little gasketed glass covers on right. them. Right. But uh, and I mean, light bulb manufacturers should expect that they're going to be installed in sealed fixtures, right? It's like if it's outside or in a wet location, it has to be tight. Yeah. I don't know. Bring it in. I'll so, taste it. So I feel like CFLs are sort of like the digital audio tapes of the light bulb world. It's like they were this big new thing, and then they quickly got just shoved away by the next technology. So, so like uh, cassettes, eight tracks, uh, VHS, <laughs> beta. What is it? I don't know. Chef would be able to describe them better, but the little they <clears throat> called them DAT tapes. Yeah, digital audio tapes, and it was just a digital recording to. Little magnetic tapes, I believe. Yeah, right, for like yeah. about two years, they sold car stereos with those things. I do not remember yeah. those at all. It was in like mid nine, early nineties. I mean, we used them in film production all the time. The audio guys all bought their bought their DAT machines, you know. And, and how long did that last before that was replaced? Uh, as soon as you could get a solid state hard drive, right? They just yeah. went out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they probably they, they were on the market for probably ten years, yeah. but yeah, well, actually, they're probably still around, but yeah, they were never. They didn't get a lot of pe- market penetration in the consumer world. Tapes are tough when you c- are competing with solid state, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Non-linear. <laughs> People say that about me all the time. <laughs> um, yeah. This is from Taylor. Uh, he says, hello, FHB podcast. I'm a longtime listener and builder in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I just bought my fir- ho- first house in August, and I'm doing a room-by-room complete renovation of it. Well, congratulations, Taylor. Today's question is about Windows. This coming summer, I plan to reside with Hardy Board. I'll be removing the old asphalt siding, adding two inches of polyiso, a WRB, and a rain screen behind the Hardy. When I get to the windows, I want to bump them out three inches so they line up with the siding correctly. I've seen a lot of details on how to flash and waterproof the windows when doing this. It looks to me like the best option is to use a mixture of flashing tape and liquid flash. My question is, do I need to use a liquid flash product specific, or is there something that I can get more readily, like an ISO or Vulcan product and apply that in the same fashion. I'm not against buying the liquid flash if it's the only way, but I also like to be thrifty where it makes sense. Thanks for the great material. Keep it up. So he's asking, does he have to use um, the companion uh, flexible flashing to the... uh, His WRB. His uh, WRB. Yeah, so so I feel like, I feel kind of deja vu. I feel like we had a similar question to this once, but basically it comes back to the safest thing to do is always to use products within a the same a single, family. single family or brand and certainly don't use products that are that are Mixed not matched. meant for that location yeah. or purpose yeah so. i think that's the key thing is to make sure your products are compatible and uh, we have a story in the magazine we'll link that on the podcast page uh but uh the the I don't think you have to use any specific brand. Just make sure that the things you were using are meant to work together, the tapes and the r- liquid flashing. What did you, how did you flash your sister's window and door? Um, I used uh, zip tape and zip liquid flashing. So, again, I mean, that was coming off the heels of doing a shop class where we did um, five window flashing details over different WRBs. Um, 
right? We did that with Jake Bruton from mm-hmm. Arrow Building. Yeah. Um, that series we cover, and that was the big thing, is just make sure whatever you're using is compatible because you can put a tape and, on a WRB that, like... Well, attack it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and that's happened. You know, mm-hmm. guys have found problems and had to go back. So um, the one thing I didn't get from his question is, is he bumping out, doing all this work and bumping out the existing windows, or is he putting new windows in? Because, like, your window's as good as your installation job. So, like, personally, I buy a cheaper window and just install it really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, I, it, I think the, the process would be the same, whether he's reusing or, or replacing the windows. Uh, he wants to, you know, get them out so they'll be in plane with the, Certainly. With the siding. Yeah, I mean, he, at, least it's, at least it's obvious that he realizes that he needs to reinstall and reflash to the new, uh, the new wall system, which is, I think, you know... When people are doing siding projects or window projects independent of each other, it's like it's tough because what are you gonna are you gonna tear off some of the siding or are you gonna plan ahead or are you gonna do all the projects at once? It's it can be a kind of a tricky thing to plan if you're on a budget or a schedule, but it just makes the most sense to do it right. For, you know, the whole job. Taylor has uh, one uh, thing <laughs> really going for him, and that this, this house is little, uh, and I, I can't stress how much difference that makes is when you have a whole house residing project a small house is obviously way easier than a huge one but it is two stories so that's going to add to the complexity cute little house though right very interesting tall and narrow i like i like it it looks very I like uh, the city right it's it's in a city somewhere or newer uh, older suburbs but boy boy it sure needs some like landscaping work new plantings yeah. on the roof <laughs> it's like the, the house is like covered with vines and looks like there's trees growing yeah, on the kinda, side of it too. Kind of looks like the Munsters or the Adams family with all that. Uh, it was an early green roof. Yeah. It's amazing. Like, I don't know where this is, but I've heard of kudzu like covering a house in a, in a season, you know, in, in, in places in the deep South, but this kind of looks like that. Minneapolis. Minneapolis. There you go. It's not kudzu then. What's the cold weather equivalent of kudzu? Snow. <laughs> <laughs> that won't cover your house. <laughs> so we've had a lot of things on this podcast that people kind of probably want to see. I wonder how many people actually go to our podcast page on the website because... Well, I'm a little concerned if you don't know that, who the hell does? <laughs> well, no. I mean, I know how many, but I... I <laughs> but, uh, it, no, whatever. Why don't you encourage people to do so? Yeah, that that's kind of more what I was getting. <laughs> was, uh, maybe, since we've been talking a lot about things that you can't see, you should check out our podcast page, so findhomelink.com slash podcast. Uh, the number of um, YouTube viewers <clears throat> has doubled since uh, we've been doing this show, so I, I think that's... Four kind now? Of, <laughs> like <laughs> Ten? And one of them asked for me to come back. <laughs> Uh, it was Patty. Mm. Patty did it. Not supposed to give out names. Hi, podcast crew. Love the show. Warning, I can be a little long-winded, and I'm an engineer. I'm also a serial DIY remodeler. I've done pretty much everything you can to a house short of building one from the ground up or anything involving masonry. My wife and I are in the early stages of remodeling our home office in Northeast Ohio. What type of flooring and what installation will minimize floor squeaks or other problems down the road? The area is over a finished and conditioned basement that is generally in the 40 to 50% humidity range. The room is about 12 by 18, and the 2 by 10 joists, which are on 16-inch centers, run in the 12-foot direction. I know that a lot of squeaks in hardwood flooring are due to poor subfloor conditions or installation. This area has three-quarter-inch plywood, and I'll be screwing it down tightly to the joists and fixing any issues before installing the finished flooring. In our dining room, I installed engineered hardwood TNG planks using a floating installation where the planks were glued together during the installation over a thick poly vapor retarder covered with a quarter sheet, uh, quarter inch th- sheet of cork. This was per the manufacturer's instructions. It was a bit of a pain to install since the strap clamps had to be used every few, few rows and one had to be on the lookout for glue squeeze out. But the floor looks great and there's not a squeak to be heard. I'd be comfortable going the same route in the office. However, it's a pr- fairly pricey way to go. High-quality engineered hardwood is expensive, and the cost of the cork adds to that. My sh- shopping tells me that high-quality pre-finished solid hardwood planks tend to be less expensive than engineered hardwood, and installing them with a pneumatic cleat nailer would be faster. But I can honestly say that I've never been in a house more than a few years old where the conventional hardwood floors didn't squeak. 
The hardwood floors in other rooms of my house squeak horribly. It seems to me that tying tightly solid wood to plywood with a zillion little metal barbs is a fool's errand. The wood is going to move over time and with the seasons. The plywood will move less, so eventually the planks will loosen enough to move against each other and squeak. I want opinions from the pros. Is there a way to install pre-finished hardwood so that it is unlikely to squeak? There's a lot out there on the web about fixing squeaking floors, but not much I could find about avoiding or preventing squeaks aside from the advice about sound subflooring. If it matters, we will likely be going with maple flooring regardless of the particular type. Hope you folks can shed some light on this. Special shout out to Kylie. Her perspective is a good addition to the show. I forget who this was. So you went and found some feedback for this guy? So I went to the most knowledgeable person I know of with regard to uh, hardwood flooring, and his name is Howard Brickman, and he's been an industry consultant for many years, and before that he was a hardwood flooring installer. And uh, he says to use felt under the, f- under the flooring between the subfloor and the hardwood. And it does a number of things. First, it kind of uh, takes up the space for the inevitable movement and provides a cushion, and it prevents um, space from developing that will allow these squeaks to occur. And uh, he also uh, cautions folks, we're always taught to acclimate hardwood flooring before we install it. But that's really not what you want to do. You want to make sure that the floor is the appropriate moisture content for wherever it's being installed. And that could be means that you don't want to put it in the space if it's the dead of summer and the, you know, it's 90% humidity. You, you don't actually want to acclimate it in those conditions because by the time winter comes around, it's going to shrink. A, you'll have gaps and B, you'll have squeaks. So... Pay attention to the moisture content with a real good moisture meter. Uh, we'll put on the uh, podcast page links to the uh, Forest Products Labs suggestions for the moisture content for hardwood flooring installations. And uh, it's pretty much for most of the country, but where it deviates is in the southwest and in the southeast where uh, it's either drier or considerably more humid than much of the rest of the country. Well, that's good feedback. I would not have been able to go there. No? <laughs> no. I would have said more fasteners because there's been times where I've ripped up flooring and I'm surprised at how few fasteners there are. Well, that brings me to my next point. You, oh my you had goodness. A, like this amazing segue and you didn't even, didn't even realize it. So the other thing is people don't realize is how many freaking nails you, or staples you need to install hardwood flooring. And um, so most flooring, modern flooring is at least two and a quarter inches and you need to put staples or cleats every six to eight inches. If you start going to wider boards, you need to put them even tighter. And the example is if you have six-inch boards, they need to be every three inches. You never see that many fasteners never. in a floor. Never. Never. And, and the guys who put it down will say, well, I've never had a problem. Well, people are pretty tolerant of squeaks. And, and uh, the other thing that happens is it, it moves uh, irregularly in the, in, the, in, the, in the dry, colder parts of the year. You end up with sections of flooring with big gaps, and then the floorboards are tight. But if you have them sufficiently nailed, the gaps are more uniform and you don't have this uh, very obvious gapping in certain spots. Have you ever seen that met much that many nails or staples go down? No, uh, and, and I think we've talked about this before. Like uh, I I'm I'm not a I'm not a like person who researches like nailing patterns <laughs> a whole lot. So it's never never been a problem for me. But but I do yeah, but then again, I'm probably more tolerant about about uh, inconsistencies and, and stuff like this. But I want to jump to the felt question again. Okay. Right? Fe- so he's saying basically asphalt felt, builder's paper. Yeah, right? 15 or 30-pound felt. So, and, and I'm guessing, I mean, because we know as a WRB it works this way, that in, in this situation too, depending on humidity and temperature, it's going to behave different differently. Right. Because the one thing, uh, when I put a... F- um, cork flooring that was a floating cork floor that was sealed on the top and open unfinished cork on the bottom in my kitchen I was like do I want something down there that's totally impervious to water so that the humidity from my basement isn't coming up or do I want something down there that's vapor open so that if water does get in there especially since it's in the kitchen it's gonna got, got somewhere to go and I chose the the vapor open uh, which I think was a mistake because because uh, your basement's wet because my basement's always been generally pretty pretty humid so yeah. the difference in humidity between my basement and my kitchen is in, in for most of the year is significant so uh, I've over the years seen the seams which were 
invisible when I installed the stuff years ago slowly kind of swell on this on this floor. So does that so. mean the floor is shrinking? No, I think moisture is coming up through the gaps. Okay. Yeah. I didn't think that floor squeaks used to bother me, but my current house between the bedroom and the bathroom is this like three foot square area that like every time I walk on it and I try and do this like, you know, uh, light stepping football thing and it doesn't matter. Well, you're supposed to have squeaky floors outside of your kids' bedrooms though, right? So that you can't, they can't sneak out in the middle of the night. Liam has a ground floor window, so I don't know what we're going to do about that. (laughs) That's what the bars are for. (laughs) Right. So uh, mm. use the felt, make sure the flooring is at the right moisture content and at the subfloor is at the right moisture content and use tons of staples or cleats. I like the staples and uh, for the simple reason they seem to hold so tenaciously. You know, they had that glue on them that when you drive it in, it melts. And then when they're set into the subfloor, they, the glue sets up and they are impossible to pull out if you try to. I don't think cleats hold as well. And so if you're going to use three and a quarter inch flooring, which is pretty typical, those staples or cleats should be every five inches. So two and a quarter, six to eight inches apart, three and a quarter, five inches, six inches, three inches apart, eight inches, two inches apart. And what this works out is to nine square, nine nails per square foot is the magic formula. So you can extrapolate based on the width of your flooring. Extrapolation. Do you have hardwood in your house? No, my whole house is tongue and groove, one inch thick pine with no subfloor right on the joists. I bet that's not squeaky. Mm, some spots. <laughs> <laughs> you have hardwood in your house? You put it in, right? Put softwood, dug fur. How'd you put that down? Flooring stapler? Um, yes. Did actually, you borrow Justin's? I think I probably did. I, I didn't so buy he, one and I didn't rent one, so I must have. <laughs> <laughs> We kind of forget where the tools come from around yeah, here, right? Not, yeah, it's probably in my shed, actually. So he has uh, one he bought from Amazon, and these things used to be stupid expensive. I remember when I was selling, they were six or 800 bucks, and there was, like, no choices. It was the boss stitch or it was the power nail, and they all cost the same, and it was a fortune. But now these Taiwanese companies make them, and I think you can find them for, like, as little as 250 or $200. Sound, and, it rings a bell. And... uh He's used his on a number of floors, and it's worked fine. I mean, for the DIYer, I don't know, like a pro guy who's putting it in all day, every day? Yeah. Spend the money. Sure. Yeah. And you can rent these things, too. Hey, but while we're on the topic of cheap tools or affordable tools, have I asked you this before? I'm looking to do some floor stair refinishing, and I definitely, I, I was, I've used the Festool Rotex system before, you said there's some stuff out there now that's comparable in some of the other brands? Yeah, I have a Bosch 6-inch that has the same uh, orbital and rotating orbital action that the Rotex does. Have you, have you used the Festool one before? I have. Yeah. It's better, but I don't know that it's you know $450 better. Mine 6-inch was a recon, and I, I want to say I paid like $220, $230 for it. Hmm. And... Uh, what I also like about it is you can use anybody's sandpaper. If you go the Rotex route, you have to use the Festool sandpaper or the holes don't line up. Yeah. I mean, you make more money than I do, so I, you know, I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. <laughs> yeah, what, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do to your stairs again? Well, it's, it's more a matter of I've got about half a dozen different projects in my house right now. <laughs> That I want to do in the next year that all involve removing large quantities of, of finish. Uh, you know, lar- like I've, I want to refinish my cabinets in my kitchen. I want to refinish some stairs. And, it, you know, it's like on a big open floor, it's easy to, uh, to strip stairs with like a planer or, or, or professional flooring tools. But for the stairs, I've found that the, those rotary sanding... Yeah, tools and, are the best. Yeah, and you need good <clears throat> dust collection because I presume there's good chance there's lead in those finishes, right? Yep. Have you told the family about this project yet? Yeah. These projects? Yeah. You're just gonna start one day, aren't you? I just yeah. That's it. <laughs> it's gonna leave all the food in the cabinets and just start sanding them. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff writes in. One question that comes up frequently on the podcast is how to bring in fresh air to the building, ERV, HRV, etc. 
While this may be easier with ducted heating and cooling system, it may be more challenging with a hydronic heating system such as gold gas slash oil fired furnaces with baseboard or with no central AC. How can one bring in fresh air and exhaust stale air when no ductwork exists? I know one way. Windows. <laughs> Open and close I didn't them. even think of that. <laughs> so the Lunos uh, HRVs or the ERVs? Do you remember? Don't remember. So the Lunos is like a self-contained ERV or HRV. I think you can buy the cartridges for or the inserts for either one, but it goes in a hole in the wall and uh, it doesn't have any duct work. And they're meant to go in the bedroom to supply the fresh air, and uh, they cycle in and out. So that's that's one way to do it. Better yeah. is to have duct work. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Is like he says, it's. It's more work if you don't already have existing duct work. But most but of the you're time, not, you're not supposed e- to use ERVs exist- are going to be independent anyway. Yeah, you're yeah, supposed you- to individually <clears throat> duct those. It's not supposed to be part of your, uh, you know, HVAC system. Yeah, so it's more a matter of just figuring out how much you want to spend on this and how much you want, how invasive you want the project to be. Because I mean, to do a true, I mean, when we saw those those passive house uh, brownstone remodels in Brooklyn, they were making the ceiling structures like several th- feet thicker in some places just to fit all the ductwork and stuff that they were putting and in there. And those were all z- Zender. Uh, I mean, I'm sure those were like 10 or 20 grand worth of uh, fresh yeah. air, in, you know, machine yep. system. But, but a lot of those ERVs run on pretty small ducts. They're like basically look like big vacuum hoses almost. So you might have to run more of them, but you could probably run those between joists. So, but again, it's a matter of how invasive do you want this to be? How serious are you trying to get about air, you know, air systems. So maybe, uh, like you're saying that Luna system, it's like, it's kind of like the same idea of you add, um, mini splits to a house. And if you don't have duct work to get central air conditioning, you add a smaller independently, um, mounted ERV systems. And they're, they're not inexpensive, but, uh, I'm sure it would be less than, uh, you know, an ERV and ducting it, the whole thing too. And I think it's also important to remember, you don't necessarily have to run the ventilation duct work to every room. Uh, traditionally it's like exhausting out of the bathroom and the kitchen and then supplying fresh air to the bedrooms. Um, obviously more, uh, inlets and outlets are better, but not necessarily required. I think it, you know, begs the question too, how tight is your house? Is, is something that's important to worry about, uh, based on, you know, the natural ventilation rate. If it's tight, of course, it's something to be concerned about. But if it's not, the one concern is where is your, uh, you know, ventilation air coming from? If it's coming from your moldy crawl space, that's a bigger problem. And if it's coming from an open window, as you suggest. Yeah, and as you pointed out, I mean, obviously <clears throat> the, the point you're bringing these different ducts to for an ERV system or HRV system is going to depend on your house. And if you're, if you're getting into a project where you're getting this deep into thinking about airflow in your house, chances are pretty good that you should hire a, a professional who designs these types of systems rather than just sort of sticking it in your house. At well, a minimum, go and, uh, you know, pick the brains of the folks at GBA and uh, ask them their thoughts. There's folks there who have experience with, uh, several different manufacturers of equipment, and uh, they have their pluses and minuses, and it's probably worth a conversation with them. And I know there's been some discussion about how well the Lunos uh, uh, mini ERVs work, um, and uh, I think there's some, depending on the house, they work very well or they don't in larger homes because they're small. They're, they're not moving all that much air. Have you seen those things? I have. I've uh, never installed anything like that. I have a pretty leaky house, even though I've done a lot of air sealing. Um, have you put a blower door on your house? No. We should go do that someday. Oh, goodness. <laughs> you don't want to know. It's, it's yeah. safer not knowing. That's, yeah. Yeah. I, maybe we should. I, but, but when I'm ready to, uh, like, I know exactly where the problem is. So, like, What's might, your biggest uh, air infiltration area? I, I have a, a ridge beam on my second story addition I put on that um, back before I worked for Fine Home Building. (laughs) Uh We all have these conversations, so don't feel bad. (laughs) Don't feel bad. I did it the old way, and um, I have sheetrock butting up to it, and I I wrapped because I had, um, it was uh, the LVLs, just this giant sandwich up there. It's like three by 20. Whoa. It's huge. How'd you get that up there? Three pieces built it 
you know. Yeah, but put you, it together you, you hoisted the individual pieces up by yourself? Not by myself. I had my friends over uh, that day. Um, I'm glad I was not there that day. Yeah, you weren't my friend then. <laughs> and after that day, maybe we would have been friends. Yeah, the, all the other people left, too. So I just have sheetrock going up to it, and then I wrap the beam in pine. So there's a lot, in, you know, and there's a ridge vent above it, so... So, I mean, I've I've dealt with a bunch of air sealing in some of the older parts of my house where I wasn't going to go in and repaint or add anything or where I transitioned between, like, the baseboards and the floor. And I've had some pretty good luck with using some clear, uh, clear sealants, like clear paintable caulk in gaps like that. So, like, I don't know if the, if, is the pine beam unfinished? Well, or... the, the, I would like to pull the pine off anyway because... I did a crap job, and it doesn't uh, okay. look good anyway, so I, I'll have straight access to it. I'd probably hit it with a foam gun. Or tape. Okay. Tape yeah. is that. Oh, yeah. Tape it on, from the drywall layer onto the beam. Yeah. And then, I was and then you'd hide it with the wrap, the new wrap. With the new wrap, yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, I don't yeah. mind. I don't okay, mind so you are, that Okay, so you are planning on tearing into it then. Yeah, for yeah. sure. That's not really that. That's the easy part, right? I mean. Since I'm doing essentially a whole house remodel, right? I'm, I'm, I'm like stuck at halfway done right now. Yeah. And that's one of the things I got to get to. But um, you I'm, mentioned some other things uh, in the near future. What else are you going to do? Gut remodel of our main bathroom, and I'm going to do a curbless walk in shower. So, will you waterproof the whole bathroom floor? Uh, actually, I think I'm not going to. How, how's that going to work? It's going to get wet on the other side. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to do like a partial wall, uh -huh. right? So that to give some privacy for yep. when you are standing in the shower. So I really only have the one, the curbless curb it's section. It's like the opening. The opening. And I'll have a glass door. And uh, I'm going to go with a large format tile in the main part of the bathroom and same color, but probably two by twos in the shower area. So I can really, you want to uh, slope it. I want to slope it the way I want to slope it. And, um, one thing I'm going to do, and I don't know if this is smart or not, but I'm going to have the shower head come straight down out of the ceiling. Neat. Cause every time I turn on the shower, whoever was with me before now, it's like hitting the wall and splashing out, mm -hmm. and, you know, that won't be happening. Mm -hmm. So, and they won't be able to reach it to adjust it. So <laughs> I got a pretty low ceiling. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Probably gonna hit my head on it all the well, time. Well, that's an ambitious project. Yeah, but I've given myself nine days to do it, so <laughs> not that bad. <laughs> Are you trying to get divorced, or what is the what is the, the, well, the no, overarching uh, motivation well, this, here? It uh, coincides with my daughter's spring break, so my wife and daughter will go stay with the in-laws for the week, and I will work, you know, twelve-hour days. That sounds grueling, man. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. Do you look forward to this, or is this a, uh, a, a overwhelming project? Um, there's parts of it that are o overwhelming. I just know it's going to be very physically demanding. Oh yeah. But um, I can't wait to have the new bathroom. You know, yeah. as the house is coming together, it's just you know. That's something that's holding you down. Oh yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm going to have to borrow your uh, Bosch. Uh, the demo hammer. Yeah. Rob's got the big one right now. I need yep. the big one, Rob. Okay. How's I'll, that working? I'll hurry up. I. I put some nice holes in my basement floor with it. So Rob is using <clears throat> a uh, Dewalt uh, demolition hammer. It's electric. It's like a little jackhammer, right? Yeah, and I and I I know you said that because you had a bit, a uh, drill bit for it, and you also had a big wide chisel. Yeah. And you're like, oh, you're probably going to need a narrow chisel. I tried it. My my basement's like a rat slab, so the wide chisel actually it went broke it no right problem. up. Problem just went right through it. And That's an amazing tool, right? It's really nice, and it, it it's got a shock absorbing handle on yeah. it. A lot of the tools have that now, which, I mean, I. I would, my joints would be shot if I'd use the, uh, the old school ones that are just like rigidly mounted to the motors. Um, we can thank the <clears throat> Europeans for uh, creating standards that uh, other, that, that ma tool ma makers had to uh, make their tools less, transfer less vibration. And in and, and this country, we're benefiting from that because, of course, those tools are sold internationally. Yeah, I actually have a, just one of those like Husky brand, uh, like Home Depot. Um, Air chisels that has a handle like that. They sell one with and one without the, the shock absorbing handle. And it was like an extra 15 bucks or something like that. I'm like, no, I'll get the shock yeah. absorbing handle. Because, like, if you've ever had to use one of those tools for any time, you, like, you can't feel your hands after a period because of the vibration. It can't yeah. be good for you. No. But, uh, but yeah, so I cut a, like a two foot by two foot hole in my slab and it was 
anywhere from like three quarters of an inch to like two inches thick. Did you wait till everyone was like in the house reading and doing homework oh, yeah, before you care. started like? I don't, I don't <laughs> care. I'll, I'll wait till, I wait till my, I went to wait till wait until my daughter went to bed. <laughs> Wake her up. That's why they love you. <clears throat> But, uh, you know, the funny thing is that I remember I was telling you I did a radon test in my house, and it was it was just at the level where they say you should probably take action. But they usually say, do the radon test. If it comes up with it at a certain level, then do a second one just to confirm. Well, I did the second one after I cut the big hole in the floor. So I'm going to see if <laughs> maybe there's any if that makes any difference. Uh, you know? That'll be interesting. I would suspect it would go up, but yeah. we don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I'm about to mail it out this morning, so. About to this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else do we have here? You guys have anything to add? I'm tapped. Tapped? No. I, I, my brain's kind of fried. I've been working on... you got well, a new project, right? Or the company does. On the, oh, on the website. Yeah. I, um, we're, we're expanding the organization of our website. We, you know, the thing is, we've got something like 12,000 pieces of content on our website from, you know, since 1981, we've been producing articles. And then since the eighties, we've been doing videos in the early nineties, maybe. Um, I could say with some pride uh, that our company has always been uh, very progressive with regard to adopting new media to present the information for our consumers. And it's uh, what's next. Well, so the thing is, as you get more and more stuff on the website, um, it's harder and harder to find what you're looking for because there is so much there. So we're, uh, we're building out these project guides where we're curating collections of our best content around popular topics that we're working and on decks this is right now. Decks, right? And so eventually, uh, very soon, you'll be able to go to the website and instead of just searching for random articles on decks and hoping you find the one you're looking for, it's organized by s sequence of, you know, the process that you would go through to, to do it from planning and design to permitting to footings and foundations to framing to decking to finish details. Oh, that's so smart because oftentimes when you go looking for information on a subject that you may be somewhat familiar with or not at all familiar with, you don't even know what you're looking for. Yeah. You, you need to like be introduced, well, this is how you do this thing. You don't even know to look for that information, right? Well, and that, and that, and that goes to another point that I, I brought up today is that um, some of the stuff is very obvious to us because we're so familiar with the process of most tasks involved, involved in home building. But to someone, to different people with different skill sets, you, you might be a smart person, you might be experienced in construction, but just have never done this particular type of project in this particular environment. So there are some really basic articles on you know, safety equipment and tools and material options that a lot of people aren't going to need, but they're there for the people that do. Neat. And Very you've cool. kind of had an ev evolution in, in your content process too, right? Recently, you went on a, a video shoot, but you also came back with photography. Yeah, I went on a two-camera video shoot plus a still camera. And you did and all this yourself. Yeah, it was quite interesting. Luckily, um, we rented 4K video cameras, which allowed me to have wider shots. And, you know, in post-production, I was able to reframe if I needed to or do some movement on it. But yeah, no, it was, uh, it was something running all those cameras and getting all that content. <laughs> so for those of you listening, uh, it's, uh, Peter Polson, right? Is the, is Rail the style custom woodworks is Seguin, Texas, Seguin, Seguin, Texas. He's a, a cabinet maker and he has built, um, a gridded top assembly table, cutting table, uh, to help with his woodworking business, and he showed you on video how to how to build it, and it's got some pretty awesome features, right? Yeah, he built a new one because I mean he built a prototype and it worked great, the concept worked, but it had some issues that he wanted to work out, and so rather than using just kind of the scraps he had around the shop, he, bu he bought some nice three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood, and um, you know changed it up a bit. So my favorite thing is how like the gridded top allows you to clamp anywhere, but it also like allows the dust to fall through so it doesn't mess up your assembly process and it yeah. saves time, right? While you're working, you're not moving dust. You're yeah. not sweeping. 
And so the bottom of the table actually has, uh, it's sloped, right? And it funnels the, the dust to these collection bins on the ends. Yeah, that's part of the modification was he had it, it just fell to the floor and he was like, oh, I'm like constantly sweeping. So how about if it, you know, a passive system where it's just sort of gravity and vibration moves it along into these collection bins. And uh, it's cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Great guy, too. When is that uh, uh, going to see the light of day? Um, I think it's going to coincide with the release of this, the magazine, the article. In uh, which issue, is uh, issue 292. Yeah, I forget the month release on that. It's, it's about two and a half months from now, I think. So look for that, folks. Uh, I've had a chance to uh, see the photography, and uh, it's really a cool project. Very cool project. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thanks to... Rob and Colin and Jeff for joining me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And remember to check out the show notes at findhomebuilding.com slash podcast. And please like, review, like, review, or comment, however you're listening, watching. Yes. So other folks can help find the podcast. Yes. (laughs) Likey is good. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.